everybody. Uh, my name is Alexander Stocker. I'm from the Virtual Vehicle. So welcome to the second webinar of the Evolve uh, Horizon 2020 project. Uh, this time it's about uh, data analytics in the automotive domain with Evolve. The webinar is co-organized by us from Virtual Vehicle with the guys from uh, Cola, Sergio and Alan. And I think we have quite some, some fascinating talks today. So um, the first talk will be from, from Sergio Amakora from, from Cola about predictive maintenance. What is the idea behind predictive maintenance and the predictive maintenance model? Then Ellen will uh, go more into technical details. So how the model was built and how it was deployed on the Evolve uh, cloud uh, environment. After these two talks, uh, we will shift the topic a little bit. We will uh, talk about um, automated driving functions. So how to detect the status of an automated driving function of a vehicle assistance system by using uh, camera streams of the vehicle dashboards. This will be given by Andreas Vestel. Immediately I followed up by another talk uh, from Andreas about um, a time series data analytics, uh, specifically about pattern detection in, in time series data analytics. And finally, my colleague Johanna will uh, close uh, the talks uh, with, uh, again, with a very fascinating uh, topic in automotive data science, driving driver distraction detection using camera data. Um, we will talk, we will do these talks in a, in a, in a row, but uh, there will be uh, plenty of times for questions and answer after the talks. And uh, please, everybody, if you have a questions, uh, note it, uh, post it in the, in the chat or in this uh, question answer section in, in, in Zoom. And I think there will be enough time at the end to answer all these questions. Okay, I don't want to bother you anymore with the introduction. I would immediately uh, hand over to Sergio from Cola for the first talk. Sergio, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexander. I'll grab the screen from, from you. Uh, here we are. Uh, so as Alexander uh, noted at the beginning, uh, today I will be discussing more about predictive maintenance, why is it used, uh, and how we deal with predictive maintenance at Kula. Uh, in general, so the agenda would be at the beginning, uh, I'll talk about a bit about the problem, the current problems with diagnostics. I'll give an example of target diagnostics, how it is done at the moment in, the, in general uh, in the automotive industry, uh, and what are the problems, um, what is vehicle predictive maintenance, uh, and uh, how we do vehicle predictive maintenance with DTC codes, uh, potential issues with predictive maintenance as well as pros and cons at the end. So uh, the current problem with diagnostics. So the problem is the systems are becoming more and more complex, which means that we will need uh, in the future, we need some uh, different and better way of fault detection uh, systems in place. Um, building specific diagnostics system is expensive, uh, which means that, especially in the automotive industry, OEMs uh, have historically uh, created specific algorithms for specific faults, uh, everything done uh, upfront. And in the case of, let's say, less frequent faults or non-critical faults, such as, uh, such as a compressor malfunction or, for example, jam cylinders, uh, uh, cooling systems and, si and, and similar, uh, they do not give enough incentives to create specific al algorithms for them. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, it is unrealistic to expect that um, uh, those algorithms will be created for each individual fault at the end. Uh, last but not least in the automotive industry, especially, that diagnostics is an afterthought. Uh, that basically means that in the automotive industry, um, in many cases, components are not built with uh, fault detection in mind. Uh, and it is not common, at least not until a couple of years ago, it was not common to install additional specialized sensors to different components, parts, uh, and similar. Um, as an example, uh, I wanted to give you uh, an example of uh, um, a turbofan engine uh, in the aerospace industry. So in the case of this specific engine, uh, the um, design engineers that designed the engine defined 610 uh, different uh, failure modes. On the other hand, during the first two years of operation of those engines, 727 different uh, faults happened. Uh, the, the warning thing is that just 142 of those uh, uh, actual uh, faults that happened in the field uh, were those that were uh, anticipated upfront, which is just 23%. This shows uh, that there is definitely uh, a need uh, for a different system of diagnostics to be in place. Uh, 
Um, so we started working on predictive maintenance, but why predictive maintenance? So predictive maintenance aims at identifying vehicle maintenance needs before uh, those actually happen. Uh, by leveraging data, for example, from, I don't know, from warranty repairs or from garages and similar, uh, coupled with, uh, uh, with current vehicle sensor data, uh, predictive data analytics can actually find meaningful relationships uh, that will be very difficult for humans to discover. Uh, on the other hand, maybe a performance anomaly that uh, looks like insignificant uh, when, um, when observed on just a single vehicle uh, might actually become a red flag uh, when it happens of hundreds of different vehicles at the same time. Uh, vehicle predictive maintenance is currently more suited for commercial vehicles, mainly due to the uh, cost component, uh, but it is expected to be a standard for all the vehicles in the future. Uh, we at Koala um, work on predictive maintenance based on DTC codes. I tried here uh, to show a classical example, let's say, of a vehicle that is driving through time uh, and it has different DTC codes appearing on the, uh, on the ECU of the computer, uh, on, the, on the ECU of the vehicle, and at the same time has different uh, job types that, uh, that the vehicle has been treated. So our hypothesis for predictive maintenance was basically that uh, giving a sufficient number of repairs that has been performed by humans, uh, coupled with the DTC codes that lead uh, to those repairs, is it possible uh, to create uh, a, machine, a meaningful machine learning model uh, that will discover a relationship between the DTC codes and the, and the repairs at the end? Potential issues, uh, basically, uh, as repair description get more granular, more specific and similar, the modeling, uh, the modeling problem becomes uh, harder. Uh, for example, if we just restrict the problem uh, to one thing. For example, identifying whether a car uh, is going to have an unscheduled, uh, an unscheduled, uh, let's say repair, whether it's uh, transmission, engine, suspension, and similar at the end. Um, the problem is manageable because we can use like the whole data set to actually predict uh, what is going to happen and to train the model. While if we actually want to get into the specific of the like transmission, suspension, engine repair, and similar to get to the subsystem, to the part level, uh, and similar, we must group the available data in smaller data set and then train the model on those smaller da data sets. The benefits of, of this kind of uh, predictive maintenance based on DTC code is basically that uh, all the data uh, needed for the approach is already available, can be retrieved from uh, either from garages or from, uh, from OEMs uh, or uh, aftermarket providers. Uh, together with, with an OBD device. So there is no need for an additional hardware or an additional investment for that. Um, there is a high predictability of system sub-failures, such as, as I said, transmission, engine, suspension, in a reasonable period of time. And it's the easiest and the cheapest one. Uh, what are uh, the shortcomings on the other hand is that uh, more data and more vehicles uh, are needed to enter into more details about subsystems and, 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 and spare parts. Uh, and in addition to that, um, on one hand, even though uh, it improves the current technology and the maintenance uh, procedure by linking uh, the DTC codes with the actual repairs, it's still, we still have a problem on solving uh, unanticipated faults that might happen uh, in the future in vehicles, which is probably the next step of predictive maintenance where we'll have uh, anomalies detection and similar at the end. Uh, that will be it from my side. As for the Q&A, as, uh, uh, as uh, Alexander pointed out earlier on, uh, please do write your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer all the questions uh, once uh, all the presentations are over. Thank you. Give the word to Alan. Okay. So, I'm... Okay, I'm Alan from Cola, and uh, I'll try to give uh, more technical, but still not to be too much technical details about uh, how the machine learning model was implemented. So uh, facing any machine learning problem, uh, the first thing that you need to do is a post a nice question, a good question, like what you really want to solve. And I think Sergio already did that in uh, his presentation before. So I'm going to just continue on that with uh, more technical details where I'm going to uh, uh, give insight on how, how the data looks like that we are dealing with uh, a, a basic machine learning 
uh, learning model overview and how it is implemented and uh, how it's connected to the whole platform, how it's deployed, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, tweak into the KPIs that we have at the moment. So that's uh, uh, something that I'm going to talk about. So uh, regarding the source data that we are dealing, uh, the, the main source is uh, something that is called a freeze frame free stream data that uh, that is a data that has all the numerical values uh, of the car at the moment that a specific DTC code happened. Uh, besides that data, we also have some additional data, which is a timestamp of uh, when it happened, uh, what was the type of the engine, uh, what was the type of the car, and then the data about failure and malfunction or breakdown, and then uh, uh, something that was done on a specific uh, DTC. Uh, for instance, if a specific part was changed and uh, how, how much was uh, the cost of that part or the parts. So uh, the data, as Sergio said, can be uh, acquired by, uh, on the aftermarket. So we are acquiring the data from our partners and uh, we are receiving the data, the data on, a basic, on, on a weekly basis. And uh, the data is uh, CSV form, uh, format. Uh, so it includes, as I said, it's... It, the size is like 38 column of numeric, numeric parameters. Uh, those parameters might be intake temperature, vehicle speed, RPM, uh, mass airflow, and some other uh, numerical parameters. And one which is uh, also the DTC code, and the, and the one which is additional, something that we did in our prepar preparation phase for the machine learning, which is called a call to action, meaning like... Uh, the probability, for instance, the probability of a specific code is this, and uh, this is something that you should do because uh, this is there is a high probability of DT, of this specific DTC code happening for you. Uh, so, thirty eight columns of numerical value is a quite a big and dimensional space for the machine learning. And uh, also, uh, regarding the size of the data that we have at the moment, is more than four million records. Uh, our machine learning model is a, a is a basically a basic machine learning model where we have uh, the most important thing is like that we split the data into something that we call a training data and uh, something that we call a validation data, and uh, our learning algorithm we are not using only one model. Uh, the, the important thing here to say that we are we are using six different models and we are text, testing against all these models and then we are selecting the, be the best one. Also, at the moment, we are working on the seventh one, but we don't have the full results uh, yet. So the basic flow of the machine learning model implementation is, you know, probably the, the hardest one is to prepare the data and then we separate out a validation data set. So we use the test harness, uh, uh, we use the method that is tenfold cross-validation. Uh, I'll try to explain that a bit later. Uh, as I said, uh, multiple different models we are uh, deploying in order to create the prediction and then we test all the models and then we select the best one. Uh, with every time we uh, get the new data, uh, we are running the same flow uh, with the updated set of, set of data to get the better results. Regarding the uh, separation of the data, uh, the ratio is uh, something that we take 80% of the data for the training and we use 20% uh, uh, of the data for validation. And just to explain what is a test harness, so it's basically when you take the data, you split the data into 10 parts, you use nine for training and then uh, one to test, and then you repeat uh, uh, until you cover all the combination, different combinations. As I said, uh, we have six different models implemented. Uh, we tried uh, to cover linear and nonlinear models. Uh, and uh, once we test the results, we are selecting the best one. So for instance, at the moment, uh, the best results are with the support uh, vector machines models. And I have to say that we are also using the TensorFlow now and uh, some initial results are saying that we might get the better results. Uh, how we are connected to the Evolve, like there are three basic set steps, uh, how help Evolve help us uh, run the model, train the model and test the models. The first thing, as I said, is like that we are receiving the data on a weekly basis. So we need to update the data every time with the big file that is already on the Evolve. So we need to have a sync between our internal server and Evolve platform. Just every time we receive the data, it, uh, it sends the data to the Evolve and then we trigger a new uh, training uh, cycle. All the code and all the model implementation has been done in Python. Uh, 
uh, using the Python libraries and now the TensorFlow. Uh, once uh, we uh, implement the code, uh, that's, uh, we create a Docker image and that Docker image uh, is being pushed to the Evolve platform via the private registry. Uh, and then on the Evolve platform, once we have the Docker image ready and the big file with the, with the, with the data, uh, we use the Argo flow uh, in order to parallelize all the models. So basically we run all the models in parallel. So this is a table just showing a uh, small key performance indicator uh, that was run on the 20K records. And you see that uh, it, it was almost the double uh, uh, of, the, of the speed on the whole platform just on the small set of records. But, uh, so this is for all the models. And I think the best KPI in general is like, uh, when we phased the file of 2 million of records, we were not able to run it on the local machines. While uh, now having uh, more than 4 million records on the whole platform, I think uh, some average time is around 30 minutes and we run all the six different models in parallel and that's done. Uh, so we, uh, regarding this file, it's not like a memory consuming, so we are more like a computational uh, uh, problem. You know, just 4 million records, you need to <laughs> kind of compute everything. And as I said, that's 38 different columns. That's, that's quite a big. And uh, one more time, uh, at the moment we are using the TensorFlow where we want to utilize the GPU uh, uh, features from the Evolve platform. And I think we are going to get uh, much better results. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. And this is uh, again, reminder that you, if you have any questions, please post them in the, in the, in the Zoom chat or in the Q and A section. In, in the Zoom. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ellen and Sergio. Uh, now let's, uh, so please, uh, as, as Ellen said, please post questions in the, in the Q and A uh, window. Um, the next speaker then is, is my colleague, Andreas. He will start with this yes, first talk on right. uh, vehicle assistance systems. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Perfect. OK. Um, OK, what's this problem about? Um, in the modern vehicle, you have a lot of assistance systems that help you driving the vehicle, like a cruise control that controls how fast you're going without having the driver pressing the gas pedal. Um, you have often a lane assist so that the car steers more or less automatically, at least in certain situations, and much more systems um, that support the driver uh, and take away some of his responsibilities. And data about how those systems are used is really valuable for research. So you can, if you look at, the, at how often the drivers activate those systems, how they use it, how long they use it, you can learn about the driver behavior, but you can also learn about the systems and how to improve them. The problem is you do not easily get that data. If you're the car manufacturer, then it's easy. Then you have access to all the internal control units of the car. You can just access the status of the system. But if you are a third party research organization, such as we are at Virtual Vehicle, then you don't have access to the car's internal systems and it's really hard to get the information. So what we did do um, to still get access to this, to this data is some kind of hands-on approach. That is, we mounted a camera in the car, a GoPro camera, filming the dashboard. So as you can see here on the, on the right side, um, we filmed the dashboard from the side. And you can see this symbol, this symbol, and also the car here that indicates the status of the assistance systems. In this case, cruise control, lane assist were all active. And there was a car in front. So we had actually adaptive cruise control that um, adapts its speed to the speed of the car in front. How does the status detection work? In theory, the problem is not so hard because we know what the symbols look like. So the symbol for the lane assist here, it looks always like this. So you just need to search the whole uh, picture using some kind of similarity measure like cross cor correlation or similar um, until you find it. But that's just a theory. And in theory, many problems are easy. In practice, it gets much harder. Um, for example, we have different camera angles. So uh, when you mount the camera, it's not always at the exact same position. So um, 
those images get distorted and don't look exactly the same. This is one problem. Another problem, and even the bigger one, uh, light reflections on the dashboard. So if you're driving in broad daylight, the sun shines through your car window on the dashboard, you really get a lot of reflections and different light conditions. So sometimes it's really bright, sometimes it's really dark when you go in a tunnel, for example, and sometimes you really have a, a mirroring effect that you hardly can see um, anything because there's so much uh, light. So this makes the detection in the end um, much harder than one would anticipate just knowing that there is a symbol. What did we do to mitigate those problems? Um, for the first one, the different camera angles, we defined a set of uh, reference points on the dashboard that we could detect uh, more reliably from different angles um, that are more easy than the, uh, than the symbols for the, for the assistance systems. And then we used uh, some kind of de-warping or rectification of the images by detecting those characteristic points and uh, computing a transformation uh, matrix that could um, warp the image in the correct um, angle. Regarding the light reflections on the dashboard, we used uh, a contrast enhancement method, histogram normalization, um, and it was a, a special histogram normalization that was contrast limited and also adaptive. It's called Kiehi. It's a, a special um, algorithm that worked quite well in, in our case. All those operations we do on the images, um, we implemented in OpenCV using the GPU uh, ready interface. So we can uh, run our code as well on CPU and also on GPU, which is quite important if you want to speed it up um, at the Evolve platform or somewhere else. And everything, of course, was then capsuled in a Docker container um, so that we could transfer our program to the cloud platform of Evolve. So that's the, the image, what, that was the image detection in one frame. How does it work uh, if you now want to process many videos and not just one frame from one video? Uh, for this, we used also Argo. So Argo is a system that uses uh, custom resource definitions in Kubernetes um, to implement something called workflows. So you can uh, think about it like this uh, diamond shaped thing here. You have uh, one step. If this is finished, we have a lot of steps in parallel. And if all those are finished, you collect the results in a final step. So the first steps, the first step here would look for new video files. Uh, in parallel, we have the processing of all the video files that were found new. And the last step collects the computed information and computes uh, summary statistics. On the right side, you can see how those um, definitions of the workflows look like. It's apart from the definition. And this screenshot is directly from the Evolve dashboard. Um, and there you can see a workflow in progress. The first step of the diamond is already completed. And we are now in the, in the parallel phase where we have a lot of video files uh, that are run in parallel. And as soon as this is finished, uh, we would see the last step of the diamond. It was uh, really good that we had the Evolve platform um, to, uh, to detect the status of the system systems in our situation. Because as you can see on this timetable, if uh, we did it on a local laptop, the processing time for one video was uh, 41 minutes. And we had 300 of those videos. So uh, we would have needed eight days and 14 hours to process the videos. Um, like doing nothing else if the laptop uh, wouldn't have broken down anyway before that. So that would be quite a lot of time and work. Uh, on the Evolve platform, on the other hand, without using the GPU, uh, one video took a bit longer than on the local laptop. But that is expected since we have some kind of network overhead. But we can parallelize uh, massively. So if we, for example, use 50 CPU instances, and we could have used much more because there's more available, but we wanted to use just 50 for our experiments, then that scales down to only six hours and uh, 42 minutes. If we uh, additionally enabled the GPU accelerations, 
the processing time for one video falls down to 24 minutes. Um, and if, if we use uh, PPU and CPU uh, in parallel, then we could process all 300 videos in just four hours and 39 minutes. That's 41 times faster than the eight days, 14 hours on our local laptop. How does the result look like? Um, we output statistics in a machine readable format for further calculations, but we also output like subtitle files uh, for the videos that show the exact status. And as you can see here, uh, we have that video. Um, I, can, I can play it. Now we have the status. Um, the cruise control is activated and in use because the symbol here is green. And soon there will be a car appearing here in front and then the status changes. So let's have a look. Yeah, here it is, the car appeared. And as soon as it appeared, we had here a status change car in front. Um, so that's like the output of, of our algorithm and also from other systems or the, the, the indicator. Okay, um, this was um, a talk about the, the detection of the status of the vehicle assistance systems. Thank you for your attention in this talk. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A tool or note them down so that uh, we can talk about it in the end after all talks are finished. Then let's go on to the next topic, um, which is pattern detection in parsimonious data streams of vehicle data. What's this about? So as research organization uh, in the mobility sector, we have often the situation that we're interested in a certain kind of, of event or situation like um, hard acceleration, hard braking, or really fast acceleration, a fast lane change, um, fish tailing, and so on. So you have certain situations that are interesting in terms of, of research or for the development um, of engines or assistance systems. And so you need data about these situations so that you can see what happens there. Um, of course, you can always go on the test track and, and produce those situations, but in the end, this is quite expensive and does not produce much data, but only some um, re really few data points, of course, because you cannot do and record everything by yourself. And, and for machine learning models, you would need thousands, ten thousands, or even uh, millions of, of recordings. So a good thing is certainly if you can have end users, like normal drivers that use the car day to day, that can produce data for you. So if they want to participate in a research project or maybe they get other benefits, and then they may, might share the data they produce with you so that you can, as researcher, um, get access to the interesting situations and um, then run your analysis on the data. Um, most comfortably, this would be done with a smartphone because every end user has a smartphone. Um, but if you transmit the data from the smartphone, this poses, of course, quite a lot of challenges um, because to detect the pattern, it's probably a quite complex situation. You can uh, not do it on the smartphone in most cases. So you need to transmit the data to the server, to the cloud platform. And if you do this with the whole data, um, then you get a real high data volume, which may be hard to transmit over a mobile network. Maybe the reception is not so good. Um, then you cannot even transmit it. And even if you can transmit it, then you have, of course, a lot of privacy concerns. If you send all the data the smartphones of the user produce to a central server, and many users would have a problem with that um, and uh, then would not participate in, in your data collection campaign. So we thought a solution for that could be that we transmit only a subset of signals um, and in really a low frequency. So maybe only one or two signals and one data point per second or per two uh, seconds. And in this low frequency data stream that can not really be used to tell what the user did, we search only for candidates of our patterns. So we detect, yeah, this could be something that is a situation of interest in that low frequency data, which is not complete. And if we found such, if we find such a candidate that tells us, yeah, this could be interesting, then we request that the smartphone um, to send the whole data. 
So to recap, we have a smartphone data, data locker that receives uh, some kind of pattern specification from a server. This specification contains information on which signals are needed to find those pattern candidates I was talking about. So to find those um, time windows where we think that something interesting might be happening. So the pattern specification contains a list of signals we need and uh, how many points per second the smartphone should send. Typically, it's one point per second. The smartphone data logger now keeps the current data and the complete data, not only the, the low frequency one, but the high frequency data with 100 points per second maybe, and also all signals and all sensors that are available in a ring buffer locally, but it sends only the signals in the pattern specification in low frequency to the, to the cloud platform, not the whole data. And if the platform uh, then detects a pattern candidate, then it notifies the smartphone and says, this looks interesting. Please give me the complete data you have in the ring buffer. Um, and this is then sent to the platform where it is checked again if it really contains the interesting pattern now that we have access to the whole data. How do we do this um, detection of candidates where we check if there is something interesting that it's worth sending the whole data? Um, we do it using SAX, the symbolic aggregate approximation. Um, it's a quite simple comparison, but it has the, the advantage that it gives a lower bound for the true Euclidean distance between two signals. So it's really a good method um, to find candidates. Everything we build is implemented using exclusively big data suitable components like Apache Kafka for the central message broker, um, Apache Spark micro batch streaming for the processing of the data streams that come in. Um, and, and so on, so that we can really scale out to many smartphones uh, sending data. We also implemented a so-called interceptor, which is basically a translator from the smartphone to Kafka because the, the smartphone cannot really talk directly to Kafka. So the smartphone connects using WebSocket um, to our interceptor on the platform already, which then translates everything um, to Kafka and back. Let's look at the high-level data flow. As the last, last slide in this talk, um, no, sorry, that was the wrong option. This is correct. So let's start on the top right here. On the beginning, we have a researcher, a data scientist that gives the pattern definition. What is interesting? Um, which situations are we interested in? And how do we find candidates? This is stored in Kafka. Um, and if now a new smartphone here depicted on the left side um, connects to our system through the interceptor that is already running on the platform, then it gets that pattern definition to the smartphone. So now the smartphone knows which data to send um, for detection of pattern candidates. This data is then sent to Kafka, is checked in the, in the low frequency one hertz data for pattern candidates. If a candidate is found, information goes back to the smartphone um, and the smartphone uh, looks into its internal buffer. Do we still have the, the high frequency complete data for the situation of interest? And if yes, then it's again sent back to the platform. That's checked again. And if it's confirmed that it's a tr really the pattern of interest um, also in the high frequency data, then it's transmitted to a long-term storage. Uh, it's a Postgres database uh, with time scale. Um, so that then the data scientist can access all the patterns that were connected. Additionally, the app uh, uses uh, Firebase to store uh, logins at detected events and, and metadata for the trips. So some kind of um, the, the things around you need to have a, a working app stored in this, but this is not part of the Evolve platform like all the stuff on the right side here. Okay, this was the end of my second talk. Um, thank you a lot for your attention. And again, questions are very welcome um, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Uh, so our final talk then will be by Johanna about driver distraction. Johanna, the floor is, the floor is yours.
So hello everyone, sorry for this delay. Okay, good morning everybody, also from my side. My name is Johanna Moser and it's my pleasure to briefly present the uh, Proof of Concept 3, uh, Distracted Driver Classification Approach using the Evolve platform. Uh, but why is detection of distracted drivers that, um, that important? Um, let's have a look. Um, the World Health Organization issued a report um, on road safety in 2018. And the tragic number that comes up with that report is that each year almost 1.35 million people die in road traffic crashes. And one of the most common causes for serious road accidents is distracted driving. Just to pick one distraction type using a mobile phone makes a driver approximately four times more likely to have an accident. And the thing is, uh, distracted drivers will, will, will be still a problem in autonomous driving in the future. Um, so what is the current state? What is done to prevent um, driver distraction? Um, the current situation is that only a few vehicles have distraction detection systems. Um, they are mainly high-end cars. And these cars almost always use only vehicle sensors to decide if a driver has its focus on the road or not. Camera-based systems, in contrast, are not that common so far, but they could contribute to make driving safer for all, driver, for all road users, uh, no matter what, what, what kind of car they use. We at Virtual Vehicle wanted to contribute to such a camera-based system that could be used um, by everyone. Um, so to ensure the availability to everyone, we decided to use smartphones again, to gain data for classification and detection for of distraction. Um, the smartphone is placed in the car and is filming everything in the cabin of the car, including the driver. Uh, an app on the smartphone was an already trained model, decides whether you are distracted or not and warns you if appropriate. And so how to get to such a model? And this is when the Evolve platform comes in. Because a model needs to be trained and therefore an appropriate training data set has to be found and stored. And for almost any machine learning algorithm, there's the, the need to pre-process the data, which is also done on the Evolve platform. And this pre-processing could include, uh, in case of images, resizing, rescaling, augmentation, or adding additional features. And with this data, a uh, machine learning algorithm could be trained and a model can, can be gained. In this case, a model to classify pictures if a driver is distracted or not. But um, let's have a more detailed look on, on each step, starting with the data set. Um, luckily, we used uh, the, the publicly accessible state from data set with over 22,000 already labeled training images uh, with a size of 640 by 480 pixels. And there are 10 different classes available. One class for safe driving and nine other classes for certain common forms of distraction. Like we all know, texting, talking, adjusting the radio, music player, drinking, and so on. And also there are 80,000 unlabeled test images. And this raw data set is stored on the Evolve platform. The next step is to pre-process the data. In our case, we just resized the pictures and did some normalizing. And to make a connection to the Evolve platform, in this step, uh, we are using a Zeppelin GPU and OpenCV service from Evolve, uh, which are available through the Evolve dashboard. As you can see in the first screenshot on the slide, um, this is the Evolve dashboard. And here you can see an overview of our used service services. There are many more services, but that's the services uh, we are used. The second screenshot shows the Zeppelin interface. Mm -hmm. Apache Zeppelin is a convenient web-based notebook like Jupyter, but can use many more uh, different interpreters like Python, Shell, Spark, and many more. And the third screenshot shows the nice to use service for file storage. We can up and download files to the platform. So after pre-processing the data, basic model architecture was created. In our case, a convolutional neural network, which is quite common when you are dealing with images. Um, the first draft was made locally on a client using Visual Studio Code as an IDE. 
In the next step, uh, the model was transferred to the Evolve platform and training and evaluation on a single node in the cluster was performed, again, using a Zeppelin notebook. So to enhance performance and speeding up the training, a distributed training approach was realized on Evolve. With distributed training, more nodes could be used. In our case, four nodes with eight GPUs in total. Um, to realize this approach of distributed training of a machine learning model, our Evolve partner force provided another really easy to use service, namely a virtual cluster inside of the Evolve cluster, which could be used by a common client tool called Cubebox, which you can see in the screenshot here. And to evaluate and, and monitor the training, TensorFlow, uh, as many of you may know, um, the TensorFlow built-in tool was made accessible through another service. You can see here the TensorBot dashboard uh, in, the in the screenshot. Um, I want to draw some attention uh, to the distributed training on the Wolf cluster, as this is really a great way to fully exploit the possibilities um, in this cluster. So during distributed training is, uh, or distributed training is possible with the introduction of a virtual cluster, as you can see in this, in this graphic, inside the existing Wolf cluster. And this virtual cluster is deployed again with a service. The service is named MPI TensorFlow GPU. MPI is just a set of function in IP to develop high performance parallel applications. And additional to this MPI service, um, deep learning framework for this distributed training with TensorFlow um, um, is pre-installed, namely Hoverbot. Howard, may some of you know, it was initially created by Uber to speed up training in deep learning and is uh, used in this case as well. And with the MPI service and Howard, it's now possible to take a single GPU training script and scale it to train across many GPUs. And everything made possible with just adding a few lines of code needed by Howard. So um, in the end, uh, the, 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 the created model could classify images if a, if a driver is distracted or not. And the results were quite good, as you can see in this short example. The green title of images indicates that the class was predicted correctly. And the accuracy was quite high on the test test with, with around 98%. And the computation time, as you can see in the table, could be significantly reduced um, the training of the model is now even 50 times faster when using the distributed training and approach. Still, there is room to improve, but for now, we are happy with the achieved results. And yeah, I'm really happy um, to, or really looking forward uh, to your questions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Johanna. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, I think uh, we have <coughs> plenty of time for questions and answers. I don't see any questions yet, but maybe there might be the one or the other question popping up. In the meantime, I'll, I'll try to, to ask a question uh, by myself to, to Andreas. Uh, Andreas, could you probably give some examples for, for events that, that are you, you are likely um, or that you are looking for or, or, or exploring uh, where you would like to use uh, your approach? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. For example, uh, what is really interesting for me, um, uh, lane changes, um, because there you have um, the, the difficulty to distinguish a, a lane change where you just go from one lane to another um, from some kind of, of uh, fish tailing where you go too fast uh, and you over or under steer. And I'm really interested in how, the, the, how this looks in the data, right? It, it is clear you see something in, in the acceleration sensors. It is clear you see something in the rotation sensors. Um, but it's not so easy to give uh, like thresholds where you say, okay, this was now a controlled lane change and this was some kind of dangerous situation uh, where you almost maybe hit someone or your car um, over or under steered. And this would be a situation where I would need a lot of data to do some kind of classification and clustering um, to really 
get um, thresholds um, on, on the data that is there um, to distinguish those two situations which are similar um, in the data, but uh, quite different in reality. And there the system could really be useful. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. So, any questions yet? Seems that everything has been pretty clear, at least it looks this. Um, I, I have a question to the guys from Von Kohler, uh, probably to the data set. So how many different car models are in this data set? Is, is there one car model or are there more than one car model? So these 5 million records? So initially we started with the one uh, model. It was just one engine model, but now we have uh, between the 100 and 200 different models. And uh, something that we are not ex explored, but it, it might be interesting and we are trying to do is to try to make a and find a correlations between different models because like it's always important that we talk about the same model, but those correlations are, might be interesting for and uh, might provide some uh, initial knowledge, some additional knowledge, sorry, about the uh, predictive maintenance and what happened. Yeah, right. What we're trying to do at the moment is actually to, to find some, let's say, correlations between same type of engine and, and different types of body, uh, with same type of body, but different kinds of engines, with like across diesel engines, across uh, 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 like uh, uh, other types of engines, as well as whether there might be some correlations between the different brands as well at the same time. Because some kinds of error might, might be uh, like some cars might have like the same component or the same part, but in different kinds of engines and see whether uh, there is a correlation between like different uh, kind of completely different kinds of cars, uh, meaning both body as well as engines at the end. Sounds interesting. Do you have <coughs> any indication for what type of, of, of engines or what type of car models um, the approach works particularly very well? So predicting um, maintenance and, and, and uh, parts that I replaced? Um, I think it's, it's, uh, we didn't look that, uh, I mean, we, we didn't prepare this for, uh, uh, for, for, for this webinar, but, uh, in, in certain cases, we definitely have a much, a much better prediction than in other cases. Like, for example, uh, at the moment, unfortunately, it's more related to the quantity of data that we have. Uh, so where we have more data, it's, it's, it's definitely easier to predict, uh, uh, than, than else. So I think still the problem, even with 5 million records across different cars and across different, um, across different uh, like engines and types and, and, and similar, I think the biggest problem is that we still need more data in order to be able to predict additional stuff. I think this is just a good indication for us that the more vehicles we have in the system, the better the prediction is. Uh, but we still with 5 million records is not, uh, uh, is not ideal. So uh, our partners uh, from Innova, they have more than 150 million records. So we are currently in the, in the next phase to actually get access to additional data from different vehicles or from even the same type of vehicles, but different kind of engines at the end. So I think we'll get a much better indication about uh, uh, what really can we achieve with this kind of predictive maintenance once we get uh, access to additional data. Thanks a lot. Very good. <laughs> Very interesting. Thanks. So looking a little bit at the chat and the question and answers, I don't see any, any questions appearing. Um, I assume everything might be pretty clear now. So let's wait maybe for a few, few seconds. And if nobody is asking anything, I uh, think we, we can close the webinar. Okay. So I assume we can close the webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the, to the presenters for presenting uh, this very uh, interesting um, data science uh, challenges uh, to our guests. And also thank you very much for the participants to um, listening to the talks. As you might know, this is the second webinar of the Evolve webinar series. We have uh, six webinars left. So have a look at them and, and maybe, maybe tune in if there is something of interest to you. So I say thanks a lot and uh, have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.